animals. Whatever their shape or size, animals seem to fascinate us all. In today's wide world, we found some not so common animals that also get along very well with their human friends. First, we're going to Colombia and up the world's mightiest river, the Amazon. It's a thousand miles of untamed wilderness with only a few scattered settlements along its banks. This is one of them, a village called Letitia. Around here live the Yagua Indians who can trace their origins back to before the Incas when they were feared hunters and nomads of Peru. But it was the animals around Letitia that induced one particular American to put down roots here 15 years ago. And it's the animals of the Amazon that we're here to see. No jungle would be complete without a snake. In this case, it's a 15-foot long anaconda. And here comes the intrepid white hunter. The man in the mud is Mike Salikas. He's overdoing the dramatic fight for survival. But then, it's all part of his special involvement with the river that is now his home. For Mike Tillichus is one of those larger-than-life people, and he's become a living legend along the Amazon, where he dabbles in a variety of businesses connected with the animals he loves. And it takes a special kind of devotion to make your living wrestling with giant anacondas. But Mike does it often, and sometimes with alligators. In the past, he's walked through a pit of rattlesnakes and drunk their venom as an encore. At the center of Mike's activities is the zoo he's built up over the years at Letitia. Naturally, reptiles are a specialty at the zoo, and the Indians from miles around know Mike will pay a hundred pesos for a new specimen. Mike first arrived on the Amazon to trap rare animals, but today he takes tourists for hunting trips, or for the less adventurous, a stay at Mike's hotel and a tour of his zoo next door. Even that experience is unsettling for some. But Mike believes the best way to overcome your fears is to take them in both hands, literally. This is an alligator lizard. Small, but powerful. It has powerful jaws and a nasty bite that can take off a finger with ease. But if the enemy looks too big, the lizard can run away with incredible speed. They're difficult to catch, but this one was brought into Mike only two days ago. Mike persuaded this young lady to take a hold. She's not entirely convinced. See, it's all in the way you hold your mouth. This spiny turtle, with its curious shovel-shaped head, is a little more docile. They're a common sight along the banks of the Amazon, and a delicacy to the local Indians. Monkeys tend to be the most popular inmates of any zoo. They respond easily to affection, and they're always on the lookout for a tasty tidbit. But nobody wants to miss the snakes, and Mike, being the showman he is, has a way of hotting up the entertainment. Here, he's provoking a red-tailed boa. He's handled hundreds before, so he knows just how far he can go with this one. Mike's interest in snakes goes back to his youth, when he opened up his first zoo at 19. He says it's the element of danger linked with his own love of the theatrical. This boa seems determined to get itself into a knot. In fact, it's trying to get a good hold on Mike so as it can squeeze the life out of him.
but our young visitor comes to the rescue. She's obviously overcome her fear of Amazon wildlife. When the tourist scene becomes too hectic, Mike likes nothing better than to spend time on his own 1,000-acre island in the middle of the Amazon River. He calls it Monkey Island, and he bought it from the Indians 15 years ago. He then spent 10 years removing predators, planting fruit trees, and stocking the island with rare squirrel monkeys. There are 30,000 of them here now, and Mike reckons most of them recognize him by sight. Paradise is in the eye of the beholder. And for Mike Tsilikas, the white hunter turned tourist operator, paradise means plenty of animals and plenty of Amazon jungle to wander through. From many types of animals, we switch to one particular type of bird, the pigeon. We're in Yugoslavia and the border town of Subotica, because in Yugoslavia, they take pigeons very seriously, especially in Subotica, which has gained itself a reputation as a major center for pigeon raising. These people come to Subotica every Sunday. They stand around in the town square for hours, swapping stories, as well as buying and selling their prized birds. All pigeon sales are documented, and the sellers have to be registered with the National Pigeon Alliance. In Yugoslavia, birds of a feather stick together, and that goes for bird fanciers, too. Buyers and sellers alike handle the birds with pride, heartbroken to let one go, but eager to get home with a new example. Always among the breeds for sale, the Sabotica Trembler, a distinctive bird with a characteristic neck movement. It's been named, of course, after the town, and they're a popular buy with visitors to Sabotica. In Yugoslavia, they call this a post pigeon. Originally bred from the rock dove, it has a highly developed homing instinct. And that's just one attribute which pigeon enthusiasts say makes them so fascinating to keep. No one's quite certain how pigeons manage to return to their lofts after long and tiring journeys. It's a puzzle which adds to the magic of the pigeon and, of course, makes possible the sport of pigeon racing. Homing pigeons have been bred domestically since the 5th Egyptian dynasty. That's 3000 BC. And since then, they've played a remarkable role in world history. Pigeons formed a postal service for the sultans of 12th century Baghdad. They sped communications across the expanding empires of Genghis Khan and acted as messengers in the French Revolution. There are reckoned to be nearly 300 species of pigeon in the world, and Yugoslav breeders claim they've created 120 of them. Mating is a curious business in the pigeon world. The larger bird here is the male, and he won't be put off no matter what chase he's led. Pigeons have a quick courtship and an even briefer coupling, just a matter of seconds. It's clear pigeons have no time for romance. Five or six days after mating, an egg is laid and a second follows about 40 hours later. Incubation's complete in 20 days. These are what the gourmets call squabs, a tasty morsel. But to the pigeon fancier, they're nestlings, and he'd no more eat them than his own children. They double their size within a week, and before the second week, they must be banded for identification if they're to be used for racing. At two weeks, the birds are fully feathered and can soon fend for themselves. These strange mutations belong to Basic Frangi, one of Yugoslavia's top breeders. 
His specialty is decorative pigeons, and although these interbred species might look ungainly, they're very rare and extremely valuable. Frangie has put 42 years of breeding into them. Even so, one can't help wondering how the poor birds are ever going to see to fly. These are a variety of English carrier pigeons. The crust around the beak and eyes is not a disease, just an unusual mutation. And these elegant birds are budimpestas, large eye and short beak. Frangie's varieties are almost endless, created by the skillful crossing of mates. It's a skill that's recognized among his fellow breeders, and he's been rewarded by diploma after diploma stretching back for years. Throughout Yugoslavia, pigeon breeders are known as the clan. They say it's a hobby which appeals to any age or class, and for the breeders of Zabotica, the pigeon is a bird not only with a noble past, but with a bright future. Elephas Maximus. To most of us, they're simply Asian elephants. And we're in Thailand for our last animal story, because it's here that elephants are not only regarded with religious zeal, but they're one of the best examples of man's working partnership with the animal kingdom. These elephants are off to work in Thailand's state-owned forests. It's an unusual occupation for elephants in Asia, but Thailand just couldn't do without them. You can't go very far in Thailand without coming across elephants in some form or another. They feature strongly, for instance, in religion, probably because one legend says the Lord Buddha took the form of an elephant before being reincarnated as a man in his last life. There are at least 20,000 Buddhist temples in Thailand, and like this one in Bangkok, you'll find numerous stone effigies of elephants. This is the usual way to cut down and haul teak trees. But in Thailand, many forests grow on steep slopes where tractors cannot be used safely. And this is where the elephant comes into his own, because he's at home on the mountainous slopes, and there's the added advantage that he can eat as he goes along, relieving the workers of transporting bulky tractor fuel to remote and inaccessible spots. The world's only vocational training center for elephants is here at Pang La village in the north of Thailand. The center's run by the government and was set up only 12 years ago. It takes four years to train an elephant and so far about 25 of them have graduated. The main thing about training elephants is to catch them young. Until now, this little fellow's had the freedom of the jungle and he's quite inseparable from his mother. Getting a rope around his neck is only the first step, and even that's not easy. He'd love the tasty titbits, but he's determined not to leave his mother's side. She, in turn, has seen it all before, and she waits calmly while the professional handlers patiently try to get hold of her difficult infant. <laughs> At last, the first rope is around his neck, and it's the first taste of discipline for this youngster, who's named Play Satid. It looks as though he's having a rough time, but in fact, the handlers are being very careful with their new pupil. A wooden pen or crush awaits the tired youngster, and it's only a matter of time before he's manhandled inside. 
he'll stay in the pen for about 10 days until he's calmed down. Then, Play Satid's new handler, or Mahout, will start getting him used to being mounted, teach him basic commands, and begin the lifelong relationship between elephant and handler. <laughs> It's virtually impossible to train an elephant who's more than 10 years old, but young ones adapt to the new situation fairly quickly. After the month of basic training, the elephant is ready for lessons in timber hauling. It's a four-year course, which means that most elephants will have graduated by the age of 10. When the second stage of training begins, the elephant's already used to the dragging gear on his back, and he's learned to lift his leg on command to help his handler mount and dismount. For all their size, elephants are very sensitive animals, and they have a tendency to fall ill if put under too much strain. Three working days are followed by two days of rest. The mahouts come from nearby farms, and the elephant's training is their responsibility alone. One basic movement is the crouch. The mahout simply shakes the massive earlobe with his knee, and the elephant responds. Once they're used to the chain harness around their necks, the elephants, usually in pairs, learn to drag their first log. Later, they'll go solo. This exercise is known as tandem dragging, and it's used where the path is narrow. Usually, it's the female that follows, for good reason. Unlike her partner, she doesn't have tusks that could make a painful impact from behind. Here, each elephant is chained at a different end of the log. It's called side dragging and is used over short distances. This one's being trained to roll a log by pushing with its trunk. It's far easier, though, for the older elephants, who use their tusks like a forklift. This exercise is much more difficult than it looks. What he's learning here is how to raise the tip of a log and guide it with his powerful trunk while he walks on his knees. As well as doing exercises like these, the elephants go into the forests every month to get accustomed to the noise of the machinery used in the timber cutting. Once they graduate to the forests, elephants work very hard. In return, they're well looked after, and their future is guaranteed. The last lesson is how to raise a log and carry it with the trunk. Here, it's being done by one elephant. But for larger logs, it may be done in pairs or with any number of fellow students. Despite its immense size, an elephant's not as strong as a human, weight for weight. A full-grown elephant can haul a maximum load of about two tons. That's half its own weight. And it can lift no more than three quarters of a ton, or the weight of an average car. This kind of work is so valuable to the government's timber industry that the elephants are given three months off to wander through the jungle during the summer. They're also well-fed and they're given the best medical care. Although working elephants are recruited at the age of four, they reach their prime at 25. And they're only expected to give full service until they're 50. Then, it's a case of light duties only until retirement at 60. After that, a healthy elephant can expect to live another 40 years, receiving the same care and treatment he got when he was a worker. All in all, Thailand's not a bad place to live if you're an elephant, particularly if you can get onto the government payroll. During their hours off, the elephants are free to wander in the jungle. 
the weight of the chains around their necks stops them from wandering too far. But after a hard day's work, elephants and handlers first head for the river for bath time. That's when the elephants are really pampered because the masters become servants and give their partners a welcome scrub. Just like humans, elephants get hot and tired working in the sun all day, so a cool bath eases the muscles, reduces body temperature, and tones up the skin, even though their skin looks like leather to start with. Bath time over, it's back to camp for dinner. And if you're thinking of owning an elephant, it's worth bearing in mind that they need 500 pounds of hay a day and 60 gallons of water. Finally, a joint farewell from elephants and handlers, the perfect partnership and the perfect picture of animals on parade. <laughs>